I, I will mm -hmm. clearly say I'm not an expert in UAP by the least, but I do know law enforcement and I am concerned that uh, we don't have enough effort within the law enforcement community to prepare for uh, whatever it is that's required, like training and policies and equipment for officers to deal with this reality. Chris Lado, welcome to Lado Files. Welcome everyone to Lado Files. I'm Chris Lado. Uh, today, I want to bring on two actual guests. You may have seen both of them in a few of my videos from the hearings or pictures. So I wanted to invite them onto the show and get their impressions of the hearings. Hope you guys enjoy it. So let's first, let's bring on Keith. Keith is actually, he is a retired law enforcement and he's done a ton of teaching all around uh, the US. So let's bring on Keith Taylor. Thank you for being here, Keith. Thank you so much, Chris. It's, it's my pleasure and honor. I'm a regular watcher of your show. And uh, it's actually the reason why I was able to get into the hearing on that day. There were only about 30 seats available for the public. Uh, oh, so really? I, okay. I, uh, so yeah, excellent. I was, I was really happy the night before you, you and Martin Willis were talking about how uh, there's going to be a large demand for people to go there. So mm -hmm. I, I made my travel arrangements uh, so that I'd get there early enough that I'd have a shot. And as it so turned out, uh, I, I was able to be in that the first 30 people that, that were able to get into the uh, to the hearing room. And I, I imagine there must have been, I've heard up to a thousand people that were waiting mm. to get in. Uh, the demand was said. so great. Like it. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. So I, yeah, because uh, I was the last one in. I was number 30. Even though my name was on the list, the list just, just disappeared. Uh, and they almost didn't let us in. So <laughs> that may have backfired. But yeah, that's uh, thank you. Yeah, so you've been a, a patron, and uh, and that I shared that information. We met, uh, as well as uh, the next person I'm gonna bring on as well is uh, Michael. Michael is actually a retired dentist. He is is also instructed, uh, and he also made it. Thanks for being here, Michael. Welcome. Well, thanks for inviting me to D.C. It was uh, definitely an historic day, and there's a lot to dissolve. And I think Keith will agree. It was uh, it was quite a scene there that morning. Yeah, so uh, when did you guys arrive that morning? Uh, I'll start. I got there at 3.30 in the morning. Originally, I was planning on getting there at 6.30. Oh, wow. And okay, uh, too, as soon as yeah. I heard Chris talking on air about, well, it's going to be packed and we're going to have to get there mm -hmm. early, you were telling that to Martin. I was like, wait, I'm going to be there too, so I need to get there early. And that's yeah. exactly what I did. And thanks to you, I was able to make it. Otherwise, I would have been one of those thousand people standing outside. Excellent. Yeah. How about you, Michael? What's... Well, that's why you got in, Keith. You got there at 3.30. I got there at, at 7. And Chris, the military officer here, said 7.20. I recommended as a dentist 7. We moved it to 7. Yep. And yep. I didn't get in. I was in the overflow room. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry, right, Michael. Sorry. All good. Yeah, I was surprised because um, Martin Willis, was. he said he would call me if people were showing up in line overnight. And, and he did call me. Uh, at five, but I, I did not wake up. So I didn't, I didn't get there. I got there a little before seven and barely got in. But it, actually, you know, we, if you notice, there were some notable figures ahead of us. I'm not going to name any names, but some notable figures that didn't wait, it didn't wait in line early. You know, they weren't there so early, but uh, <laughs> that's okay. I, I, that's fine. You know, I think those people probably deserve to be in there. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Either way. So I guess, Keith, uh, what was your general impression of, of the hearings? You know, I'm, I'm still ecstatic about having the opportunity to witness history. I know that the majority of people that are vaguely following this or not following it at all don't really understand what's going on. But it was historic that you had for the first time ever, despite whatever efforts were made to delay it or divert it or, or keep this from happening, you had witnesses and a whistleblower talk about uh, corruption happening behind the, the, the uh, national security veil, um, how various types of manipulations of, of monies, of programs, keeping it from Congress. And what I've said previously is that if people have cognitive dissonance or have an ontological shock dealing with the idea of NHI, non-human intelligence, don't worry about that. Think of this as just an average, hugely large corruption probe. 
and and use whatever you know reason that for it that you want to fill in the blank. But the 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 fact of the matter is, for multiple multiple decades, you've had unknown amounts of money used for illegal programs, not under government, not under congressional control or uh, or, or responsibility. And one other thing to really make clear is that. The vast majority of government workers at the federal, state, and local level are just, just doing their job. They're, they're good citizens and they're great Americans. But there's a small number of rogue operators out there that have been able to get their hands on this situation and, and use it to their advantage. Some of them are in military, some of them are in private industry. Who knows where else they may go? But the tentacles lie deep. And as we go through uh, the, the upcoming uh, hearings, as well as the investigations that are taking place, at some point, people will realize the immensity of this issue. And I'll, I'll mm -hmm. be quiet. No worries. And, my, and Michael, so what was your take on it? What, from the over, you were in the overflow room, right? How, what was it like in the over, overflow room? I really felt like I was in, in, the, uh, in the room itself. Uh, okay, yeah. Sarah said the same things. Uh, she said, actually, uh, the overflow room was just was very exciting as well. Very exciting, very passionate. It was one of the one of the most exciting days of my life just to be there. And, you know, when I went to dental school at Georgetown, I didn't really have time to go to congressional hearings. Yeah. And, you that know, was, my attending, first one, yeah. was that your first one? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And the respect I saw and I tell you, Tim Burchett really impressed me, really impressed me. Like you could feel. And, 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 and Luna, uh, Mrs. Luna, and just the whole, everybody there, the energy was in, incredible. Yeah, it really felt like they were motivated. You know, they really felt um, engaged with the topic, fully engaged, Absolutely. was my impression. Absolutely. And, yeah. and Keith, you were, so you were sitting inside the room as well. Um, wh what was your impressions? Did you get any, uh, do you have any inside information from sitting in the room, your position? Uh, well, I don't have any inside information, uh, yeah. but I do, I can tell you it was electric in the room. And as the yeah. questions were asked and the, they were answered uh, with some amazing, amazingly fantastical information, you mm -hmm. could hear some of the gasps in the room. Okay, uh, yeah. And, and I, I would like to think that you know, a couple of days before the hearing, there was a, a post that one of the representatives had put out. She had a PowerPoints on her desk showing, you know, hey, just preparing for the hearing. And the PowerPoints sort of alluded to past cases that really wouldn't relate to what we were talking, what they should be talking about in the hearing. But when you get to the hearing and you hear the questioning and you see the coordination and cooperation of both uh, both sides of the aisle working together on getting at the hard truths. I think that that might have been a way to sort of uh, mm -hmm. fool some of these power brokers into lulling them into thinking that it would just be like the past hearings and not really get at the heart of the corruption. There were so many uh, challenges for them to even get the hearing room. Tim Burch had yeah. said, it's a miracle we're having this hearing. Yeah. Yeah. That to me speaks of massive effort to try and interfere with mm. this process, as well as the, uh, you know, the ICIG who's actively investigating this. And when you hear in the hearing how uh, David Grush is describing, generally speaking, the types of issues that he's had to deal with, and that it's an ongoing issue. And then you see this health records release. Well, mm. you know, That's you sad. don't have to be a rocket scientist. To, to see yeah. that it's an ongoing campaign and probably is an ongoing disinformation campaign against the general public, utilizing various types of methods and measures. Carrot and stick. Carrot, uh, as you did in your most recent uh, 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 podcast, Chris, where you outlined following the money to see where these large amounts of uh, investments by defense corporations which congressional leaders they're going to and where they were positioned in the oversight process, as well as this, that's the carrot. Then you have the stick where you use uh, uh, influencers in media and academia and other places to uh, try to send out a negative message 
to kill the messenger, so to speak, or at least their credibility. And then, of course, the other stuff, which is even, even more amazing, is what I would just generally call wet works, where you're talking about the physical harm being conducted against individuals. And that means that once all this occurs, we're going to have to do a historical review of all those cases where there was some question as to how people were injured or killed, if they were involved somehow with some of these uh, the information about road programs before a whistleblower process was available. Yeah, exactly. And um, let's see, how did you get into this, Michael? Let me, let me how did you get into UAPs? Well, you know, what made you go to the hearing? Well, um, in, in a way, there's a similarity. I, I was a dental implant surgeon. I was on a mission with a team, and we had a CT plan and technology. But while I was doing that, uh, my dad was also a dentist, and he got me into spirituality. So I've always been on a dual search. Uh, Ten years of ancient architects and archaeology, and then it all led to the 2017 article with Leslie Keene. And then when you look into, mm -hmm. she's looking into, you know, her ass is looking into death and UAPs and phenomena. There's a consciousness tie in here that interests me with archaeology and the phenomena. And I'm just, I'm retired now and over fascinated. How can I tell you? Yeah. What was it like to meet Leslie Kane? I, I'm assuming you met her when there. I shook her hand and uh, it was special. I mean, she's, and I've been doing some deep dive into what she's done. And I mean, that whole 2017 article before then I was screaming, I believe this is true. You know, then I'm like, all right, I was sitting back and now it's really true. And it's, and like Keith, what you said, it's, it's so deep and it's so it's ontological shock. That's going to be coming that it, unless you're in tune with this, I just feel like I'm, I, I have the winning horse in a race. I know where, where it's going. I don't know where it's going, but I know we're going there and it's really exciting. Chris, uh, if I may just, one yeah. of the reasons why, you know, I'm a law enforcement, I speak all over the media about law enforcement issues. The reason why I decided to publicly come out and to talk about the, this issue, UAP issue, is because we need more credible messengers to fight against the stigma that is decades in the making. And you can see in academia, you don't get much funding if you're looking into, as a matter of fact, you, you know, we all know the history of stigma and you know, uh, uh, lives ruined, um, careers crushed as a result of, of the stigma. We have to start getting out of it. We need, and I'm, I'm an emergency planner, law enforcement professional. I'm looking ahead. And one of the things I did is I just did an informal survey, the top police departments, state police in the country. What are your plans? What, what do you have in protocols regarding UAP and uh, uh, signings and, and contacts yeah. and even abductions? And of course, the answer is no. We don't have anything like that. Wow. And yeah. you know, not so, coming, but, you can't but, even. but we shouldn't be surprised because, yeah. and I wasn't surprised because in my entire police career, no, no one ever talked about UAP. And yeah. if they did, you'd look at them like they had two heads. So mm. it's time for credible messengers from all different disciplines in medicine, mm. mental health, law, law enforcement and other related uh, arenas to start speaking out about this issue and to drive a, a stake in the heart of stigma once and for all. And, and we have to do that knowing full well that there are powerful influences that are fighting tooth and nail to prevent that from happening, even as we speak now. What got you into the UAP phenomena in the first place? Uh, my entire life, of no interest, 2017, uh, vaguely you know, read it and okay, this guy Luel's on. But then I started watching a little bit of, uh, it, you know, he had a show, I think on History Channel. And I was like, wow, these are very credible witnesses and they're compelling mm -hmm. stories. I need to pay attention to it. And then in 2020, James Fox's uh, The Phenomena came out and I yeah. was definitely hooked. And I, I, I mentioned in one of the other podcasts that, that I started watching more of these documentaries, uh, specifically Randall Nickerson, the aerial phenomenon, the 100, 100 kids in the school in Zimbabwe that have sighting and contact. And then yeah. uh, uh, again, James Fox with Moment of Contact. And then <clears throat> looking at all the podcasts like your own, where you have these scientists and journalists and other individuals who are serious people talking about the issue. 
And, and of course, one of the things I didn't mention is I also uh, got my basement uh, book collection uh, pretty uh, built up uh, between then and now. So two, three years into the subject matter, uh, I will mm -hmm. clearly say I'm not an expert in UAP by the least, but I do know law enforcement and I am concerned that uh, we don't have enough effort within the law enforcement community to prepare for uh, whatever it is that's required, like training and policies and equipment for officers to deal with this reality. The reality has always existed. We've just mm -hmm. been in a case of denial, official or otherwise. Hmm. What's your take on the, the Las Vegas event? You know, that, that seems like the most recent time, or at least that I know about, where police were there. And one of the police actually saw, uh, actually saw the supposed green light, you know, up yeah, from well, the so sky. So the body worn camera. So we all saw that. Yep. But, yep. Uh, you know, what I was concerned about, and I get maybe it's part of the course, is you have folks sitting watching this on their computer and immediately coming to conclusions. And that's how, not how investigations are done. So you gotta be on the ground, you have to have the proper equipment, ask the right questions and go through a certain protocol, uh, which clearly there isn't a protocol for Las Vegas. And I did query them by the way. Mm -hmm. And you see by the end of the video, the officers are basically saying, listen, next time something like this happens, don't call us. Cause yes. frankly, they wouldn't know what to do. Huh. And that's the state of affairs. From a national security perspective, there are issues, you know, pilots in the sky dealing with this. But what happens mm -hmm. when it's on the ground? And, yep. and, and you can look at the historical record. There's plenty of YouTube videos like UFOB and Eyes on Cinema. And they constantly are putting out these videos of people at the time, the 60s and 50s and 70s, who are credible, who are talking mm -hmm. about the various encounters they've had. And where do those encounters end up? This is where the stigma part comes in. If you're a police officer, even if you're public about your encounter, you're gonna suffer repercussions, meaning eventual loss of job credibility. And I've seen where you know a witness citizen, Sean has gone over cases where officers have, they've publicly admitted that they've encountered something and then they lose their jobs because of stigma. And then they, they end up going into a different career or changing their names. It's intense, especially in law enforcement. You know, stigma is there, can be difficult. Um, is there any police department that has a UAP protocol? I don't think so. Uh, yeah. Out of the informal survey, I did uh, all 50 state police, and I did uh, the top five largest police departments in each state. So it's about 300 total. And I've gotten about 25% of the response. Uh, and all of them are basically saying, we don't have anything close to that. And I think... Uh -huh in the minds of police executive leadership, they would simply put any UAP encounters in the basket of major casualty incident, but, or mass casualty incident rather. But yes. if you don't have any direction or guidance about what to do, then the officers are just as uh, vulnerable as the citizens that are calling them for help. And if yeah, we don't have like medical, if we don't have medical and mental health on board too, if we don't have the criminal ju justice system the legal system mm -hmm. corrected or adapted to reflect that these are actual things and people sometimes have encounters with them. But mm -hmm. one of the things that I notice is you, you don't have uh, any discussion about uh, contact on the ground. All the discussions about sightings. Well, we need yeah. to reflect the reality that they exist. Then all the, the many decades of people stating that, oh yeah, they've actually landed and I had some sort of interaction, whether it was positive or negative, remains to be seen. But law enforcement needs to be able to mm. uh, uh, appropriately respond with knowledge about what to look for. UAP Med has on their website, they've got an, a great list of some of the signs and symptoms of individuals that may have had some sort of anomalous, anomalous phenomena experience, things like lost time, which you would not think to ask if you're a cop or arriving at the scene. You know, yeah. the, the, all sorts of things that we now need to reconsider as a society in terms yeah. of instead of uh, stigmatizing people who have been have experienced things, actually try to help them and learn from mm -hmm. them and, and treat it just as you would any other encounter. Some may be good encounters, some may be bad, just because we don't know what something is, that does not mean that it does not exist.
Uh, I'm sorry excellent. for rambling on, but I'm really excited about this and excited to be on your show. Uh, no, that was excellent. Um, it, let, I'll bring uh, Michael. So wow. you were wow. uh, you instructed as a, a dentist, you know, dental professional, medical professional. Have you looked into any of the uh, what Keith just mentioned there about the medical UAP med? Have you seen that at all? Well, what Keith just mentioned is ontological shock and not on yes. on to dentological shock, which is dentistry shock. But I'm going to tell you right now, yeah. as a healthcare provider, I don't believe the American Dental Association is that has any protocols in place for UAPs. And, <laughs> yeah. and, and, yeah. and it's really, and, and I want to go back to Father Matthew Gray, who I met at the, at the meeting, an army uh, yes. chaplain, and I believe you met him too, Chris. Yes. And uh, that, was, that was, you know what, that three, I don't like lines. I, I don't go to movies or Disney, but that three hour line was one of the best lines I ever was in. <laughs> I met so many nice people and I'm so impressed, Keith, especially with you, because I already knew about Chris, how, you know, credentialed you are. I'm looking at New York City right now. You're in charge of my city. <laughs> and uh, I respect both of you, your open mindedness and especially what you're mentioning in law enforcement about the shock that's going to come when because when I talk to my friends that I consider intelligent in healthcare or computer science, they're not ready to digest this. They haven't done the research of this. They don't know what we may know. And I don't even know what we know, but it's, it's damn exciting. Yeah, yeah, it is. I, I don't have the answers as to what it is, but just because I don't have the answers, I'm open-minded to, you know, things that don't exist, uh, uh, different realms of physicality or non-physicality that may exist that people have been talking about for, for or not just people, but societies and you know, the archaeology, who knows where this is going to lead to, but it is leading somewhere. And I just wanted to mention, besides the, uh, uh, the, the official efforts by government to dissuade people from even talking about this, you know, agent provocateurs, maybe they have a relationship with an uh, intelligence agency, it might be financial or otherwise, where they get compensation for uh, yeah. being debunkers. You, you got what I would call affectionately con artists, people who have taken advantage of a uh, lack of uh, uh, formality with the subject matter to claim various things to make money and and uh, mm -hmm. and take advantage of people's gullibility. You have those who do have mental health crisis that may believe they have some sort of relationship, which actually does not exist. And besides the agent provocateurs, we have the uh, professional debunkers that are not interested in discussing any aspect of the reality of the issue. So you're fighting against that, all of those things, while, you know, uh, people are experiencing this stuff and just not talking about it. Yeah. I imagine that once a process is set up, an official process is set up by government to allow for individuals, regardless of their backgrounds, to start discussing their experiences, that the floodgates are going to open. Mm -hmm. it, all, despite all the stigma, I all the controversy, People are going to start talking about, well, I don't know what it was, but something happened to me was, or I saw something on the flight, or I was in the boat and saw this, and I don't know what it is. And, and that openness of allowing people to speak without being ridiculed or stigmatized or having to worry about their job or their family for speaking out mm -hmm. for the truth, it's going to really be a forceful way to, to fight, uh, fight the powerful forces that are trying to keep this under wraps. Yeah, and I and that's really why, why I wanted to have you guys on, or I was excited about it. Is you know, it's it's not easy to come onto a, po a podcast, I think, and and you know, publicize yourself, especially about this topic, about the UAP topic. You know, so I, I guess Michael, what you know, what what made you decide to actually speak out? You know, to come on the to come onto the podcast. Oh, um, well, I've, I've been public speaking in dentistry for the last twenty years. Oh, yeah. I, I love sharing my my thoughts. Yeah. And this is a topic, um, you know, as I'm retired now, this is becoming more important. You know, it's funny. My dad was on a search for consciousness and and, and before he died three years ago, I turned him on to uh, this stuff. And he's like, oh, my, he started like, you know, talking. And he, I feel proud that I kind of brought him his realm into this. You know, it started with archaeology. And, and when you look at the ley lines and you look at, at the incredible, you know, points in, in the universe of the Earth and the pyramids and, and Easter Island and how they coordinate on a certain, I think, longitudinal coordinates. 
you just, I always ask myself questions, as my mentor Carl Misch said in dentistry. I ask questions, and until I get them answered, I want to keep asking questions, and I'm still asking questions. Uh, that's a great point, I, and I, I just interviewed John Greenwald uh, from the Black Vault, and that was his advice. I don't want to give away, well, I'll give away his advice, um, but basically was to ask questions. That's what he said, that it, and it's, it's amazing you said that. That was his main advice, was just ask questions and have an open mind. That was his biggest thing. And, and I really feel like science and, and many of our many of our systems today is you can't ask questions, you know, and, and having an open mind is often ridiculed and, and stigmatized, uh, you know. So it, I think uh, that's that's a great point. Really a great point. And yeah. Keith, where 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 are you going to go from now? Are you going to be at the next hearing? Am I going to see both you guys at the Senate hearing? I would hearing love to be at the Senate hearing. Uh, but there's yeah. so many things that are happening between now and then. Who knows where you know where we'll be? Uh, and and I think what what it looks like to me is that there are people who are in various disparate disciplines that are contributing to the fight against mm. this uh, this stigma against uh, or trying to support this effort. And so you have not just journalists that are like Leslie Keene and and Ralph. Uh, you have uh, scientists like uh, from Stanford, Gary Nolan. You, you have credible people in all different areas that, that, that are sort of contributing to the fight to um, bring this information out and to uh, make certain that the uh, individuals or entities that have been responsible for the criminality actually get brought to justice. It's a hard thing to do when they have so much control mm. and influence. Uh, but it's something that I think we're, we're going to actually see in our lifetimes and maybe a lot sooner than that. To Keith, to your point, follow the money trail. That was a very good video. And, and then and I also want to say before I forget, I went back early because I knew I got involved with your Patreon and all that because of, you were showing an episode early on of how DNA, the digitalness of DNA could be translated, you know, to data and that whole theory there. I think there's a lot to it. And uh, I find that okay. very interesting. And wait, and also, Chris, the, uh, the analogy you gave of the surfers in the ocean with the waves, how one, one surfer is going up and down, the other one catches the wave. It's the yes, particle okay. theory. I find that very relative here. Awesome. Yeah, that's from a while ago, a year and a half. So you've been know, watching. You know, you know, I'm on your show. I got to do some deep dive research here. I don't want to. Excellent. Man. Yeah, I actually <laughs> have a, a theory video on the on the way. Yeah. Let's see how yeah. it goes. Um, you know, uh, we, we are, I think, as uh, people, we are very uh, comfortable in terms of our understanding of the world and the laws of physics and reality. And, you know, frankly, I'm sure people 100 or 200 years ago, 200 years ago felt the same way. And you yes. look at how, you know, the, the folks that were trying to break beyond uh, the limitations of knowledge of during those times, you can see how they were treated. I don't think that we've advanced much beyond that kind of groupthink from, you know, generations ago. So this is really, really uh, uh, worldview changing information in terms of the NHI, but also it's worldview changing in terms of trusting government and not knowing what, if what you're getting is, is, you know, something that is uh, accurate or something that is planned to deceive. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it's going to be really eye opening. I imagine that more people are going to be paying attention to this issue. And frankly, as a planner, I think that, you know, first responders, especially, but those in the medical and mental health and perhaps religion, they need to also start planning and, and, and coming up with rational ways to to best get best practices uh, for for the people that that still have to protect and, and heal protocols and, uh, yeah. and counsel counsel you know yeah. yes protocols. So my 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 hope is that uh, you know I don't hear much from Homeland Security around this. Most of the conversations about the well the other federal agencies, the military and IC, but Homeland mm -hmm. Security should play an important role in preparing uh, first responders and American citizens mm -hmm. for the future. Well, I, I will say we have one advantage now. I, I, I totally agree. You know, if you, if you think about it, the human, you know, the human body hasn't changed 
in the past 500 to 1,000 years, or maybe we've gotten bigger, you know, because of more growth, growth hormones in the food or something. But we're basically the same, you know, as we were from 500 years ago. Chris, the teeth, teeth so have I, gotten I think we'll have the same thoughts. Better teeth? Teeth have gotten prettier. Come on. Yes, exactly. I think, and that's it. The, what has changed is technology, you know. So now I can talk to you, you, Keith, uh, across the world and Michael, and, and we're connecting now. So I think, uh, I don't think they can stop necessarily this flow of information. You know, I think we have it, the decent power of decentralization here. So hopefully we can push through. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I would imagine that the uh, very negative accounts of uh, efforts by a small rural group in government or private industry mm -hmm. to intimidate or actually hurt uh, individuals in order to keep the secret, that their mm -hmm. methods have gotten more sophisticated as society mm -hmm. has gotten more sophisticated, especially around the use of um, social media. But social media allows for really fast assessment, sometimes not quite correct, but really fast mm -hmm. assessment and sharing of information. So things that perhaps would have worked in the past, like sharing health records for a planned media hit piece yeah. can be sort of stopped in its tracks because it's publicized and demonized that effort uh, and, and then reported on by, uh, by mainstream media yeah. so that it becomes uh, hopefully uh, averted. Uh, and that's yeah, something well, I noticed my whole too. Thought on that is, uh, I don't think that was an attack on Grush, actually. I mean, it is. No, no. It's I a think it was a warning shot for anyone else. Yes. Yeah, future whistleblowers, yeah, of course. No. Yeah. That's all, I mean, he, he knew. That's he said that. in the hearing, listen, I'm, you know, they're, yeah. they're beating me up, and I expect that mm -hmm. to happen in the future. And uh, IG's office is uh, working on it. But the message was for future whistle, whistleblowers yeah. to get, you know, oh, oh. stay in your lane. Don't don't uh, act like DCG, or else you'll see what happened to him. What happened to you? Absolutely. Well, excellent, yeah. gentlemen. Thank you so much for being here. Any last last words? I have a question for you, Chris. Have you looked okay. into the Antikythera mechanism? No, not at all. I, I haven't. Keith, have you? No, I have not. I'm not familiar. So with this that. is one of the most legitimate archaeological finds that is substantiated by science that was off a, a Greek ship, I think in 1903, they found this Greek ship from 200 AD, this mechanism that now it's on Nova. You can pull up Nova on YouTube. Okay. They did an MRI, a CAT scan. This was a computer with metal gears timed to the moon and all those oh, yes, cycles. Yes, every yes, 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 yes. Yeah. yes no, no, Insane. No. So if you're, yes. that's not a one-off, I have a feeling. We have a legitimate computer rock encrusted from 200 AD. So let's put that okay. in relativity to now. I just find that very fascinating. So maybe we'll look more into that, Chris. I, I, I think that's really, really interesting. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll put a, I'll, we'll show the, the, the image right now. So we'll, see, we'll have it on the screen. I find that like one of the most fascinating things that I, you know, that's documented. Um, All right, kind cool. Of makes me ask questions. So anyway, that's how I want to end it. But I really appreciate being here with you guys. Keith, my God, I made a friend today. Oh, yeah, Michael. And Chris, yeah, obviously. I look forward to talking with you more about this. And Chris, thank you for introducing us. Excellent. Um, and I, thank you both I just uh, for being long-term patrons. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I, I just wanted to mention, uh, UAP Med, they don't provide services for, for those that are, uh, uh, you know, have, are experiencers, but they are an advocacy organization. And so they uh, uh, work they they work with medical and mental health professionals uh, specifically about uap um mm -hmm. and and they encourage research and patient care so if there are those in the medical profession that are looking to help with this issue then i would strongly recommend uap med and also for police officers uh mm -hmm. there's a new uap pd organization that is uh designed to provide a confidential outlet for officers who have experienced things, and let's face it, they're probably one of the most underreported uh, segments of, uh, of, of this issue. Um, it allows them a, a confidential safe space to talk about what they've experienced. So um, they're also, they've got a web presence as well. And, and I think probably they'll be on your show at some point. Yeah, it must make, your first responders, of course, must be, must be ready for this. 
and let's get more credible messengers from whatever mm -hmm. field of study they are in out out in front in front of the cameras talking about this issue and talking mm -hmm. about it not from a perspective of what if and maybe and it possibly if you have questions about the legitimacy of this <laughs> of this issue just read the senate 2023 NDAA amendment called aptly the UAP Disclosure Act, where they're talking about using eminent domain to take back anomalous craft from private companies that are refusing to give it. That is what we call in law enforcement a clue. Yes. Mm. So if you're worried about the legitimacy of it, I Whoa. think you can kind of hang that up. Uh, <laughs> you can that's give great. that a rest. <laughs> it's like done. That. <laughs> Okay, gentlemen, I hope to see you uh, on the webs and uh, we'll definitely uh, keep, in, keep in touch. So thanks again for your time. Thank you.